Hi, everyone. I'm Steve Neal, and today I'm fortunate enough to be joined by John Langan, the Bram Stoker award-winning author of The Fisherman, as well as House of Windows, and four collections of stories, Sefer and Other Betrayals, The Wide Carnivorous Sky and Other Monstrous Geographies, Mr. Gaunt and Other Uneasy Encounters, and Corpse Mouth and Other Autobiographies, releasing October 17th through Canelo Horror. He is also one of the co-founders of the Shirley Jackson Ward. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, John. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to to talk to me. Of course. Um, so, as I mentioned, you have Coarse Mouth and other, uh, sorry, Coarse Mouth and other autobiographies uh, coming out October seventeenth. Um, do you want to? kind of give listeners, watchers a, a rundown on the general like vibe of the collection? Sure. Uh, this was a series of stories that I wrote alongside stories from my fourth collection. I actually have fifth, uh, five story collections. Um, there's one called Children of the Fang and, and other genealogies that for some reason never shows up on, on any kind of listings. And I don't know, I don't know why that is because it was put out by the same publisher and all this kind of stuff, but it's this phantom book, but I promise it's out there. And the, there was a time when I was writing a series of stories and, and well, sort of one set of stories, if you will, um, involved responses to writers who had come before me uh, in some cases who were mine and then another set of stories thematically parallel were really digging into my own autobiography the circumstances of of my own life uh more more directly than maybe i had in the past and so i had the idea at, at a certain point oh man you know i could put these together in two separate collections usually usually i like to just arrange my collections sort of chronologically just say this is what i was doing you know, from 2008 to 2010 or something like that. I'm, I'm a, a great believer in the, the kind of serendipity that, that can happen when you just sort of put things together and, and, and say, Oh, look, look at, look at what showed up. Look at what was revealed by putting these things together. But in this case, I, I thought that I, I wanted to, to separate the stories to sort of herd them into different collections and to have one focus on genealogy. Who are the writers that stand behind me? And and in no way does that collection get it. All of them, a lot of it just had to do with, um, there was an awful lot, there were an awful lot of H.P. Lovecraft anthologies that I was invited to. And and so that kind of cosmic horror school of thing, yeah, that's, that's behind what I do. Um, and then I thought I would have this other collection that would be autobiographical stories. And I, I uh, again, you know, I thought it'd be interesting to see what happened if if you focus them, a, a, each collection a little bit more. What happens when you look at my relationship to previous writers and then what happens when we talk about my uh, my family? Right. Yeah. And I think that very much comes through in the collection. Um, and I think a lot of collections are tied together with a central theme um especially like you see you see a lot of authors really try to hone in on you know this is my collection about grief and then this is my collection right about anxiety or or whatever it may be and to me it seemed that there was very much an overarching theme of love in in this collection was that something you intended while you were putting it together it doesn't seem like it but it, it was one that no no it, it's it i was fascinated to to hear you say that because i i uh that was <laughs> love was the furthest thing from my mind that sounds terrible doesn't it but um <laughs> but it it's uh um but but I, i'm i'm fascinated to think that 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 has come out that that was there in these stories and that when you put them together you you see that in in some way more clearly there were certain stories the last story in the in the collection is a story about my mom so i can understand love coming through there you know that that seems uh not too big of a, a reach but um, thinking about the other stories in that way is really fascinating to me. You know, it, it's sort of like it puts a new lens in front of the stories for me to look at them through, which is one of the great things when when people read your work, you know, they 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 explain what you've done to you, you know, back back to you. They're like, yeah, you were clearly doing doing love. And I stroke my beard and say, yes, <laughs> yes, very good. You know, it would, inside I'm like, oh, my God, that's amazing. That was crazy. Yeah, it was um it was after I read Anchor, 
that I think I, I first had that thought of like, oh, like love is is really tying a lot of these together and, and kind of the familial bonds we form even, you know, if we, if we look at a story like Corpse Mouth, even with family that we don't know that, you know, there's mm -hmm. still love there and there's still comfort there. I think that's a really interesting message to pull from from cosmic horror um especially with, yeah absolutely yeah um you know cosmic horror to me is is historically been a, a relatively confined genre um mm -hmm. but now I, I think we're at a point where there are incredibly unique and, and personal takes on its its well established themes um you pull from a ton of things in this collection uh uncertainty of time and its inevitability punk rock mythology uh familiarity and to create like this very unique blend of of cosmic um what can you tell me about kind of creating such a, a unique and individual take on on cosmic um i i think it, you know it, it's funny i kind of feel in some ways um like i sort of backed into cosmic horror and um and that's not to say that i don't identify uh, a lot of my stuff as cosmic horror but i um a, a lot of times when i'm writing a story what i'm thinking about is i've been invited to an anthology and i'm thinking about whatever the anthology prompt is and 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 as I said, you know, in, in recent years, Lovecraft was huge, right? So a lot of the of the stories that you're reading now from five to 10 years ago have that kind of, that they're all almost by default, they're going to be in that cosmic setting because it's a Lovecraft story or whatever, right? Um, but beyond that, I've, I've become, I think from the beginning, uh, I was interested in the sublime, but I feel like in, in, in recent years, I've become ever more interested in, in the idea of like the sort of pleasing terror, you know, the, the thing that you encounter that, that opens up in your mind, you know, where you're just like, Oh my God, the universe is so big and so crazy. Um, and I, I really love that because when, when I was a kid, the things I, the horror stories and, and not only horror stories, you find this in Tolkien too. I love to read those things that suggested a sort of vast history, a, a vast um, world or universe beyond the confines of the text. And, um, you know, it's one of the things for, you know, whatever else I, I may say about them, that, that the Peter Jackson movies get right about the, the Tolkien universe, that you're just wandering around and there's just these enormous statues there, you know, that, that just, you know, oh, you know, that, that this is a world that is expansive, that has been around for a long time before you. And so I think that's that's an emotion and, and a sort of sense that I like to tie into with my with my stories. And I think, you know, when I was a kid, um, actually, I'm still a big fan of mythology. I'm fascinated by mythology and, and the study of mythology. And, and, um, and I'm particularly fascinated by the sort of development of mythology. You know, when I was a kid, I had uh, Edith Hamilton had wrote this lovely sort of summary of of. Uh, Greek and Roman myth. And she, she, she makes sense out of it all. You know, she boils it down into these sort of narratives that, that continue from the creation of the world until Aeneas. Um, but if you go back and, and you look at, you know, Robert Graves' Greek myths, which are highly speculative retellings and kind of insane, but he, he does, I, I think, get it right in, in terms of saying, look, these were myths that developed over, in, in different places, potentially the same general location, but, but different places within that location over a long periods of time, they may have been revised. They may have gone through several iterations. They may have changed when they came into contact with, with other myths and so on. So, um, so I, I, I love the thought of, of being able to take advantage of, of, of that kind of stuff too. So, yeah, I, I feel, um, I also feel, you know, when when I started writing horror um, in in the the late '90s, early early 2000s, my concern at the time was was I wanted to write stories that would affect the reader, and I wanted to write stories that the reader would care about after they were done, and I felt that the the only way I could see to do that was to write longer stories in which you you developed an attachment to the character. And and then if something terrible happened to them, you as the reader would say, oh, no, you know, that's that's terrible. So I think that that the desire to do that, I, I think, has probably resulted long term in what you're describing, you know, that this 
stories in which there were these cosmic elements, but the cosmic elements are kind of juxtaposed against these, these, in the case of this collection, you know, very intimate familial concerns. Yeah, and I think it's, um, I think it's really interesting that you, you mentioned kind of needing the character attachment to, to make the horror scene that much denser and, and, and really put the pressure on the reader because a, a lot of the stories do start very normal. You know, you're, you're, you're looking at a window into someone's life. And there's not necessarily an immediate horribleness to it. Um, yet something I found really interesting was the way you still manage to build tension through what is normal life, you know, the average day to day. I know I was wondering just the, how you go about kind of putting in tension to what everyone is used to, right? Kind of like the mundane life. Sure, sure, sure. Um, it's uh, in, you know, in the case of autobiographical stuff, it can be a little easier, you know, because I, I, there's a story in, in the, uh, the collection about, um, which is which is rooted in a visit that one of my cousins made with one, one of her friends uh, to the U.S. when I was uh, when I was a kid, and um, that you know that happened, and 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 they were these kind of strange exotic creatures to me, and and I didn't really have as much to do with them as as um, as, as as the story suggests, you know. But um, my uh, my family was was a very very devoutly Roman Catholic family. And my cousin's friend was a Protestant and that just made her utterly fascinating to me, you know, like, like, which, which sounds, I mean, it, you know, sounds so provincial, parochial, whatever, you know, yes, guilty is charged. Um, but that kind of, that kind of tension was really in, in writing the story that that was easy to, to get back into, you know, to, to, um, uh, to, to just tap into is, oh, here you are with this person who, you know, you're, you're, your parents, uh, my dad especially, was not a big fan of Protestants. But on the other hand, here's my cousin's friend who's a Protestant. So, so all that tension is 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 kind of there just in that situation, you know. And and that the story goes in certain supernatural directions, but but they were able to be informed then by by that underlying kind of you know tenseness. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense given Protestants and uh, Catholics relationships over the years but i, I figure we won't not we won't not always very healthy let's just put it that yeah. way yeah. yeah yeah not not the greatest love there um you did mention yeah. strange creatures and the supernatural and there's a bevy of of monsters and strange beings in this collection and i've i've always been fascinated by the idea of monsters as metaphor mm -hmm. why do you think we we draw to that so much why do you think both writers and readers kind of get a great deal great uh deal of comfort in terrible beings as as sure. metaphor? well i i think that um yeah, I, I mean, I I, uh, I signed one of my collections, but my, my second collection, the White Can a Sky, all monsters all the time, um, and that is, I, I I love a monster. I uh, I'm I'm fond of saying that you know, give me a story that's about like you know a middle aged college professor you know questioning his marriage, and I'm like ah, eh, but throw in a Lamia, and I'm like oh, hang on, let's there <laughs> we go. That's you know, there's something about the intrusion of that kind of supernatural figure, that monstrous figure, that really energizes my imagination. I I think that monsters you know that there's there's a kind of very primitive pleasure right you know they're, they're they're cool you know like like so that's part of it is just you're like ah oh, it's terrifying in the case of like geiger's alien designs you know they're terrifying but they're also kind of fascinating and beautiful and and really compelling right because they're they're so they're so singular i think what i love about monsters is that they at their best you know when they function well within a story they they have this this kind of um indeterminate quality if you will and 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 what i mean is is that 
a story where a monster is simply one thing is usually a kind of a boring story. But a story where a monster's kind of like, it can mean a number of different things. A number of different meanings can attach to it. That's a story that can do something really special. So I think, um, and, and it's part of the reason I think that stories like Frankenstein or Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde or Dracula or Carmilla, why they've continued to, to exist because the monsters are kind of protean, you know, is Dracula, what is he, you know, okay, he's a vampire, right? But, but is he about, um, is, is he this kind of anti-Catholic thing? Um, this, this anxiety about Catholic immigrants coming to, uh, to Britain. Is he an anxiety just about immigrants coming to Britain? Is he, um, is he the kind of awful father, you know, who gathers up all the women to himself and is like, no boys, you can't have any. They're all, they're all mine. Um, is he a representative of, of kind of unbridled sexuality? Um, and worse, he makes all the girls hot too, you know, for him. So, so like there are, I, I think all these different, um, all these different ways that we can, we can think about Dracula and, and there are, there are more, I'm sure, if we were to just, you know, do a podcast on we're just going to talk about Dracula and we're just going to take just Stoker's Dracula, we would find a great deal to talk about, you know, from just looking at the at the text. So I, I think that, that what's wonderful about monsters is is the way that they can adapt. You know, they, they just they remain themselves and yet simultaneously, you know, you think about Godzilla, right? You know, Godzilla starts off as, you know, it's the trauma or it's it's the war or it's atomic testing and in, uh, in in Godzilla minus one, Godzilla, it's still the war, but it's more the trauma of the war, and and it's more the the lingering after effects of that. So I, I think that a a good monster is is um, almost endlessly adaptable, and sometimes, you know, when I'm writing, I I try to worry about the monster as a monster within the story, if you will, and then um, my hope is is that you know an intelligent reader or reviewer or whatever will say, ah, oh, you know, that monster, that was really all about grief, wasn't it? And once again, I'll stroke my beard and say, yes, <laughs> that's good. Yes. You know, I, I, I am a belief that I have a great belief in, in, um, in our ability to make connections among things. And I feel that if I can develop a sufficiently, you know, sort of vivid or kind of lived in, in sort of plot situation, right. You know, character situation and drop a, a, a vivid monster into that. All kinds of connections are going to be made in the, in, in my mind, but also in the reader's mind so that there's going to be this, this chance for, for not just the meaning that maybe I kind of want or expect, but, but additional meaning to generate. Right. I find that frankly fascinating to know that the, the monster gets dropped in first for you and then its connections form from that um I, again i think of of anchor right and that is a fantastic story that i won't go into the the details of obviously because i don't want to spoil it for anyone that's not read it but there is a monster in in that story that i think could represent just about anything in anyone's mind mm -hmm. and I love the idea of, of you going into that with kind of a a clean slate and being like, no, this will this will be what it needs to be to who it needs to be that for. Um, I think. Yeah, I, I really embrace. Um, I I was I was kind of bowled over at one point in my life. Um, and I'm trying to think, I think it, my, my wife has done a lot of work. She, she's a, a, a professor and a scholar and she's done a lot of work with, with kind of Jung and Jung's theories. And I can't remember if she was the one who told me this or if, if it was before we met, but either way, you know, the whole Jungian idea of synchronicity really fascinates me. The idea that, you know, you, you find three things washed up on a beach and you're just like, huh, what does this mean? You know, like, like this random set, like, like your your mind is automatically going to find meaning or you know you can be mystical and say the universe is going to reveal meaning to you or or maybe they're both the same thing you know and so that um that to me is is really is is really fascinating i i am sure that a, a psychologist or psychiatrist excuse me 
would say that, you know, on, on some deeper level of, of my kind of creative process, the story that I'm coming up with, I'm, I'm, I'm figuring out, or I'm, it's, I'm figuring out some way in which it's going to be related to the monster. And I wouldn't necessarily, you know, how do you dispute that? Right. But I, I would say that, that consciously I'm more just trying to, to create a space for meaning to, to occur for, for meaning to, to be generated. Um, and um, I, I think otherwise, if, if, um, if I try to say, oh, this is, you know, this, this monster is a metaphor for, you know, the war, right? Whatever. I, I feel like that's going to, the story might still be a half decent story, but I I don't know how much it's going to live in the reader's mind. I think it's more like the reader saying, oh, right, right. Monster war. There you go. Okay. On we go. Whereas I, I, I hope that I'll, I'll come up with something where the reader might say, oh yeah, that, that is connected to the war, isn't it? But it's also connected to these, to these other things. Right. Yeah. I think it's really interesting as well that you bring up young, um, especially with the shadow and the id kind of playing a, a not non-significant role in some of those stories. Um, and that wasn't a connection I'd made in, until you brought that up. So again, I think it's, I think you're you're right on the money with things just connect in minds, whether they're meant to or not. And I I think that is kind of like the magic of writing, right? Yeah, it's it's fascinating to me. You know, there's a pessimistic part of me that thinks that really wants to believe in Jung, but thinks Freud was probably right. It's all just sex and death, you know. <laughs> it's all sure, yeah. it's all very basic, you know, and it's sex feeds into death, death feeds into sex, you know. But I I um, but I do, I, I, I do think that, um, you know, some of Jung's ideas are, are really, it's funny that it's a lot of literary criticism is, is like this. I find, you know, that, that I grew up when I, when I was doing my own graduate work, a lot of post-structural thought, the deconstructionist, Derrida, Foucault, all those guys were, were really big. I don't know that they really work in, in any way, you know, like, like, and I, I don't, you know, no offense if Foucault is your guy, but, um, <laughs> But I, somebody out there was like, Deleuze or death. Yeah. But I, I don't. Um, so I'm, I'm not trying to, to, to knock that. But, but I am saying that, like, what those guys, what, what those, like Jung, or, or what they give you is, is these sort of ways of thinking about things that that can be really useful. I'm not saying it, it it's, um, it's, it's gospel truth. But but I am saying that they're productive ways to to look at the way maybe that you know your psyche functions or or that a language functions or that a work of art might might function, and so I think um, yeah Jung Jung increasingly works for me that way um, in uh, um, in in yeah in in a productive kind of kind of way. Yeah, I think that you know I think especially with horror more. more I won't say more than any other genre, but I think horror definitely lends itself to explorations of the psyche in in ways that can I think dig a little deeper sometimes. Um, well, as a horror writer, of course, I'm going to agree with you. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. I feel like <laughs> maybe maybe a little bit of bias there, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing I was curious about and this gets a little more into kind of the actual craft aspect of it. The variety in voice in the collection is wild to me in, in, in the most positive of way. Um, Thank you. With, with some pieces reading like very conversational and giving the reader the feeling of, you know, kind of sitting around a campfire and hearing the story and, and given your already like mentioned previous love of mythology and i assume folklore by extension oh yeah absolutely um, yeah 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 do do you make a conscious decision to be like this is this is a tale you would hear kind of sitting around in the dark versus does the story kind of just approach that way to you i guess you know it's it's more with with each story what I need first is an opening line and, and, and I need, because in the opening line, and maybe it's like a couple of lines, but in the opening lines of the story, I hear that the voice of the story, if you will, you know, which, which may, 
it may be the voice of a first person narrator. It may be the voice of um, of a third person narrator, or sometimes even second. But I I need to hear the the that you know the, the sort of the tone, um, the the way the approach that this story is going to have to its own material. And so I, I think that that um, it is sometimes affected by me thinking, you know, oh, I'd like to write a story that begins as a letter. I'd, I'd like to write some kind of epistolary story. And so then that shapes the tone to a, to a certain extent. Um, but it, it tends to be something that comes up in the in the process, you know, just in the process of of um, of, of writing. I kind of find the voice and then I, you know, write to the end of the story. Um it's it's once in a while, um, may, maybe more than once in a while. Um, I, I'll write like you know, story within a story. Someone is sitting down telling you a story within the story, and I, I'm, I that has to be more conversational, right? Just by by nature of what it is, you know. Um, so so there's there are times um, that there are times I suppose that that it, it is a little bit more conscious on on my part. But I, I do think of it a lot of times as as just being about trying to find the 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 voice of this particular story. I mean, I guess if you were to read all my stuff, you would probably say, oh, he's got one voice or two voices or something, or you know, like a certain number of voices he comes back to, or types of voices he comes back to again and again. Which you know that would make sense to me. I mean, I'm 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 one one writer, you know, maybe maybe with several voices, but you know, a certain consistency underlying them. Sure. Yeah, it definitely, you know, reading the collection did, did seem very varied to me. Um, and, you know, whether whether that is exposed uh, under a, a grander, wider light, I don't I can't can't speak to that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it 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 really. I just really kind of took me off my feet of just like, damn, like, you know, it was one of those things you well, sit thank back you. with it and go like the the it's a little self-aggrandizing but the kindest one of the kindest things anybody ever said about my work was uh they said oh langan reminds me of ray bradbury and uh uh tc boyle is it because whenever i read you know read one of those guys stories i just have no idea what i'm gonna get and that was that i was like man that is that it's obviously it's funny i can't remember who said it but I remember the compliment, you know, and, and right. <laughs> um, so whoever you are out there, thank you. But um, it, it really touched me because I thought, man, that is what I want, you know, and that's what you're always afraid that you're just a one trick pony that, that right. um, you're just repeating yourself over and over. And, and so to be compared to those two writers in particular was, was really, that was a high honor. And, and that is what I strive for. Right. And I personally think that that has been attained um is there anything you wish someone had told you starting out um any advice for newer writers that that you wish someone had like hammered into your head early um you know the funny thing is is, is that the advice that i would give to a young writer is advice that i got you know which is you have to sit down and write and i remember going up to various writers, Boyle was one of them. You know, I said to Boyle, what's your advice for a young writer? And he said, marry a rich girl. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> it's, you know, practical, you know. Um, but um, I, I think that, I, I think a few things, right? I, I think that um, you have to have patience. That that might be the biggest thing, actually. That that the, the biggest lesson is that you have to be pa you have to be patient, and you're going to do the work a piece at a time. And the what that piece is, the length of that piece is going to vary from person to person. It may even vary from from like project to project. You know, there were some things that have wound up being very very short, and I just labored on them for like months and then there were other things where i just kind of you know in a month i have something written and i'm like holy cow that was ten thousand words so um i i think what i would say is is that you have to kind of you, you sit down and you write every day and there are going to be times you hate it and that's totally fine and what you're trying to do is is you're trying to almost trick your brain, you know, like, like people think that you, you write when you're inspired. I think a lot of young writers feel 
you know, they get inspiration. So if some tragedy happens, you know, your boyfriend or girlfriend dumps you, you immediately feel inspired and you write a whole bunch of sonnets. Um, and I, I think, uh, and that's, and that, and, and that is a noble tradition. Don't get me wrong. You know, the, the, the inspiration from uh, rejection, but, but I think that when you don't have that inspiration, you're like, how do I write? I, I'm not inspired, you know? And, and so I, I think, what you have to do is think about those moments when you're writing something, right? And and you're, you know, whatever it is. I mean, it's just an essay for school. And all of a sudden, in the middle of writing, some new idea occurs to you. And you get really excited. You're like, oh my God, I can't believe that, right? Well, well, what just happened? You know, like, 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 like what was that? And you know, what I would say is is that you start to write and your brain, you know, you kind of you you call the muse if if you want to be very grandiose about it, you know. You activate your your creative faculties and they're like, Oh, we're doing this now. Okay, right, let's let's get going. And I think it's in part because your brain your brain doesn't want to be bored. So you're writing some pedestrian essay or whatever, and your brain is like, hang on, if we're gonna keep doing this, we got, you know. Um, if I'm not going to check out completely, I've got to do something. So this is part of the reason I think for writing, sitting down and writing every day is because when you block out a certain amount of time at first, you know, say an hour and you just write, even though you don't feel it and you're like, oh, this is terrible and this is awful. You just keep going. And eventually your brain is like, all right, all right, all right, all right. Let's see what we can do. And I'm not saying this happens in an instant and it's like, hooray, but I'm saying that over a period of time, you're kind of training your brain in, in how to write and in how to get in that kind of writing space. I, I think the other thing, the two other things I would say, one is that you have to finish things then, you know, you sit down, you get going, bring it to a, a close, bring it, bring it to some kind of, of uh, completion. And I would also say that and I think this is something I got from from Kate Wilhelm's book, Storyteller. Um, you can think about your your kind of creative faculties as like a little dog. Um, and the little dog brings you a toy to play with. And if you just say, get out of here, I don't want that. That's terrible. Stop it. If you do that every time the dog brings you a, a toy, you're training the dog not to bring you toys. It may still bring you a toy once in a while. I mean, but... As a rule, it's not going to do that. And so if every time your consciousness, your, your creativity brings you an idea, you're like, get out of here. That's terrible. That's awful. Because a lot of times we do that, right? We're like, no, nah, I could never do that. You're, you're training your, your creativity not to work, not to bring you ideas. So when you get ideas, however terrible they may seem, entertain them play with them. You may not, they may be terrible ideas, right? They may genuinely be terrible ideas, but I've, I've found that, um, at this point in my life, I love invitations to like weird anthology prompts, you know, like, like because I'll, I'll think to myself, whatever zombie Shakespeare, that's terrible. Oh my God, who would do that? But then like, I think to myself, well, how would you do that? You know? And, and, Again, somewhere down in my my unconscious, you know, the the little fornets are like, well, let's let's start putting, let's start graphing this, that's you know, drawing plans, and you know, so I I think that um, that that there can be a way in in which those kinds of really what seem like atrocious ideas can be incredibly productive, you know, be because you you encourage your your brain to think in in new ways. So I would I would in, I would say you know sit down do the work finish it and and when you're thinking about what to work on like like don't be afraid of what seem like terrible ideas those may be the best ideas. Right. Yeah. What does a a John Lang and terrible idea look like these days? Is there has there been anything that you could recall in in recent history? You know, it, like... it's so many. Um. Um. I. I mean. And that sounds terrible. I don't want to hurt any editor's feelings, you know, but, but like, so, <laughs> excuse me, so many times I'm just like, oh, really? You know, it, it's uh, um, another Lovecraft anthology, um, <laughs> but um, superheroes, superheroes and cosmic horror, really, you know, but, but again, you know, you, you, um, the old West and horror, uh, horror on a ship, uh, you know, like, and, and here's the thing you can like, you know, with that tone of voice, you can make anything sound like a terrible right. idea, you know, but, um, but I, I think, um, for, for me, I, I think for me as well, I'll, I'll ask people, um, 
uh, I'll ask people to suggest monsters, you know, I'll be like, throw a monster at me and I'll see. It may take me years to, to figure that out. Uh, um, uh, several years ago, a guy was like, write a, it was a fundraising thing. And I was like, if you pledge at this level, I'll write a story in the monster of your choice. And this guy picked the Wendigo and it took me years to figure that story out. But I finally did. I finally did figure it out and, and write a novella. But for a while, I was just a Wendigo, you know, like, what am I? In part, the, there had been some a couple of really good Wendigo films and the Hannibal TV show and such, the use of the image. So I, I was just like, oh, man, what am I going to do with this? You know, so I, I um, that's the other thing is people will um, I, I have a few. Um, oh, who is it? Uh, the writer, Kristen Dearborn, the other the other month we did a thing together and, she, and we're talking about this. And she said, oh, oh, OK, write a story about a chupacabra. And I was like a chupacabra. Come on, man. You know, like like that's that's the worst idea. But but now it's there, you know. And now it's like, well, I got to do something with the uh, <laughs> the the goat sucker. I think they call them. So I'm like, well, all right. Let's see. You know, let's see what uh, what we can do with that. So so yeah, I I don't think that um, I don't think that my immediate response to the challenge of anything should be taken as an index of how good or bad it is, you know, because the, sure. the, there are so many stories that when you boil them down um, into like a one sentence description, you're like, well, that sounds awful. And you're like, no, that was the first alien movie. So I, I think that you, um, um, yeah, the, a guy works at a, a woman works at a terrible job, you know, like that's the yeah. first alien movie. Um so you know, it's, uh, corporate is out to get you um so i i think that um yeah that there's there's nothing um there have been things i there have been invitations i've received to things that i just i couldn't figure something out in time but i you know for the deadline but i usually just write those down and i'm like well at some point i'll get to uh, zombie shakespeare or whatever you know there you go you never know when it might pop back up yeah, yeah, that's true. Things come around sometimes. You know, I've started stories for one anthology. I ran way past the deadline. And then another anthology came up and I was like, hang on, I can I can submit this to this anthology. So. There you go. Uh, do you have any rituals around writing? You know, especially you, you mentioned a shorter piece might take, you know, months of time. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything that grounds you in that piece? other than the piece itself, you know, anything to keep it kind of like tonally consistent, relying on like music, Just, I, I, movies. You know, I, I used to, when I was much younger, I wrote to music, but I find it too distracting these, uh, these days. I, um, um, even, even instrumental music, I, I just get distracted by it. You know, I would, um, I, I prefer to write, um, when my family's in the house, um, the, the, that kind of sort of background noise, if you will. Um, I, I find, I, I grew up in a large family. And so I think that's probably part of it, that it makes me feel comfortable on, on some kind of level. And it, it just allows me to, to, I don't know, just, just to work be, because of that. I, uh, when I'm working on a story, um, a lot of what I'm doing is going back over it and back over it and back over it. And, um, in the process, sometimes realizing, oh crap, I, I need to add something here or, or wait a minute, I've created a problem for myself downstream and I need to figure that out. So it's, it's really trying to stay engaged and, you know, this sort of shuttling back and forth as I'm trying to advance the story. I'm also trying to, to go, you know, go backwards and just make sure I could look, I, I use the same word in three successive sentences there. I, I should, I should probably change that. So I think that probably helps a bit to to keep things tonally uh, tonally consistent. Um, we are running close to the end of time, so I don't want okay. to uh, keep you more than I promised. Um, I did want to ask, though, real quick, uh, whose work you're currently enjoying? Uh, if there's any newer writers you think everyone should really be paying attention to? Oh my goodness, there's there's so many. Um, it's it's. Um, you know, for, for a long time now, honestly, I've been saying, you know, that, that like we're living with this like embarrassment of riches around us. Um, and I'm always afraid, you know, I'm, it's a thing, you know, you mentioned a couple of writers, who am I forgetting? Who am I, you know, whose feelings am I going to hurt? And I, I certainly don't mean to do that. Um, there's a writer named Liz Karen who wrote a couple of novels, uh, Night's Edge and First Light, which are, are, um, 
I hate the word duology, but they are a duology, you know, the, the, a pair. Um, and it's a, a kind of slightly alternate history in which there are vampires. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's incredibly, they're incredibly well written and they're incredibly compelling. And I, I just, uh, I just, I, I was amazed really at just how much I enjoyed them. I was like, man, these things are just, just the bee's knees. Um, uh, Brian McCauley's uh, Curse of the Reaper is uh, is is a really fun kind of meta look at 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 um, slasher, the, the sort of slasher from movie phenomenon, I, I suppose. You know, I mean, Stephen Graham Jones is over there, you know, sort of carving, building his monument with the the uh, Indian Lake trilogy. You know, um, this is something that's a little bit more about the phenomenon of those of those slasher characters, the Freddy Krueger. Uh, uh, really, really the kind of Freddy Krueger, you know, the, the character who always has the, the sort of the, the witty one liners as they disembowel somebody, you know. Um, so, yeah, Brian, Brian and Liz are both uh, are both terrific. Um, I think, man, you know, the, the thing is that the, there are people I think of as my contemporaries, people like, you know, Paul Tremblay's new novel horror movie is uh, is a grand slam. Laird Barron's new collection, Not a Speck of Light, is is fantastic. Um, Nadia Balkan has a uh, a new uh, novella, which unfortunately is sold out already, um, wow. called uh, Red Skies at Morning, which is just just a powerhouse kind of work. So I I I don't think um, it, it's like you could sort of throw a stone and and hit a good writer at uh, these days. So which is which is really cool, um, but but it also leaves me feeling like oh man, you know. Like I'm like, oh, what about Nathan Ballingrid? What about Crypt of the Moon Spider? You should read that novella, you know. Um, and uh, Sarah Sarah Langan, no relation, but but her um, her recent books, uh, Good Neighbors and and A Better World, um, just you know sledgehammers of of novels. So uh, yeah, there's there's a ton of great stuff out there. I I recommend. Um, you know, I listen to a bunch of different podcasts, uh, Talking Scared and and. Um, uh, uh what's the one with michael david wilson um the horror show no it's not the horror show this is uh, 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 talking no anyway sorry michael and 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 uh and and bob bob pastorella um this is all right anyway whatever but so I, that's one of the ways that i also try to keep abreast of 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 who's writing you know what what's like like oh i heard an interview with this person wow johnny compton he sounds really interesting let me get the spite house which which is another book that's that's worth reading so um so yeah no no shortage of good things to read yeah and then um what are you working on currently what do you have planned in the future anything you can so a i glimpse of Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I'll have another collection out um, uh, next June, uh, June of 25. Um, the tentative title is Lost in the Dark and Other Excursions. Um, and that um, I have I have like a, a seventh and eighth collection that are kind of waiting, you know, in the wings. But but before that, if 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 I can make it work after Lost in the Dark in in 26, June of 26, I'll have uh, a new novel out uh, called The Cleaving Stone. And um, that will, it's sort of tangentially connected to some of the stuff in The the Fisherman and that that kind okay. of universe. But but you don't need to have read The Fisherman to uh, to read this. And that's about a bunch of, of um, kids, I guess you would say, but they're adults. They, they go looking for their missing father um, who... Uh, disappeared while looking for a local cryptid in the uh in the Catskill Mountains and uh has now returned apparently after after many years after being presumed dead um and they go to they go to see what's going on with him well i'm i'm very excited to uh hear much more about that especially hearing the connection to other things as well i think that i think there is a thank you a yeah yeah fingers crossed universe yeah but uh thank you so much for your time uh thank you thank you for some you. some yeah these are great questions i'm glad i'm glad we could really dig into things yeah um and hopefully we get to do this again in uh summer of 25 that sounds great i'll mark it on my calendar all right cool thank you so much john hey thank you